Well, good morning, friends. It's good to be with you guys. Uh, just like Mark said, I hail from the great state of Arkansas. And um, I always tell people when I travel to speak that when you're from Arkansas, it's great to be anywhere. Um, yeah, including Chisholm. And so I'm thankful to be with you guys, excited to open up God's Word with you. If you have a Bible with you, which I hope you do, um, open up to Genesis chapter 12. To Genesis chapter 12. And as you're opening up, <clears throat> I'd like to tell you a little bit about my own story, how I got here, what it has to do with you guys, and um, what we're going to be talking about today as a part of the service, and then this afternoon as a part of the missions conference. So, growing up, you guys, I was raised in a textbook blue collar family. And as a young kid, my dad's idea of fun. Uh, would be to take me out on the weekends and make me help him cut wood. So we didn't grow up where you would get 12 to 24 inches of snow, like you guys do up here in northern Minnesota, but we did live with a wood stove that we used to heat our house, and so we frequently spent our weekends cutting wood. And I remember as a young kid, I felt like our woodcutting expeditions were a great way to ruin my childhood. And so I let my dad know that um, by my frequent complaints when we would go out to cut wood together. I remember being somewhere probably between seven and ten years old running a chainsaw. Um, it was a Husqvarna to be exact, I remember. And um, I remember, that's like a lawsuit waiting to happen in today's world. And I remember thinking to myself, why are we out here? And so I would always complain to my dad, dad, why won't you let me spend my Saturday mornings playing video games and you know, melting my brain and wasting time. And my dad would always say, Sean, um, I brought you out here because I want to create father and son bonding time. I want to teach you good work ethic. Um, and he said, I want to teach you a number of life lessons. And one of the life lessons that my dad always wanted to teach me was this. He would say, Sean, if you never want to cut another piece of wood, if you never want to drag another piece of brush, <clears throat> then listen to my counsel. And here it is. Sean, here's what you need to know about life. You need to grow up you need to go to college, you need to get a great degree so that you can get a great paying job. And the reason you need to get a great paying job is so that you can just pay someone else to cut your wood. And um, I was like, Dad, that's genius. And so we came from a simple family. It made perfect sense to me. And so I grew up being told by my father, and not just from my father, but my friends, my teachers, society and culture, that my purpose in life was to chase this thing called the American dream. And my dad never used those words, but that's what he told me that I was supposed to do as a young kid, right? Grow up, take my education seriously so that I could get a great paying job and I could not just pay someone else to cut my wood, but so that I could live this thing that we call the comfortable American life. Um, and so I was convinced that that's what I was supposed to do. I graduated high school and I had the opportunity to head into college. <clears throat> not everybody gets that opportunity, but... Um, I had a chance to pursue college education, and if I were to kind of sum up my entry into collegiate life, I would have summed it up in three really simple statements, and they went something like this, Chisholm. Me, <clears throat> my agenda, and just a little bit of Jesus, right, if it was sort of convenient for me to squeeze him in. As long as the Lord didn't really sort of interrupt my life, my plans, my hopes, my goals, dreams, and ambitions, then I was content to sort of have him along for the ride as though that's any kind of a biblical Christianity whatsoever. And all of that changed, right? My pursuit of this thing called the American dream, settling into this comfortable American life, that all changed my sophomore year of college when God sent this minister into my path. And I wasn't looking for this guy. In fact, he came out of nowhere. I felt like I kind of got T-boned by him. And I remember him sitting me down and saying, Sean, um, there's some things I want to share with you that you probably really, really need to hear, but you don't necessarily want to hear. And, and here's what they are. Number one, life is not about you and your agenda. In fact, you should probably think about getting over yourself. I didn't laugh. Um, <laughs> I felt like I got punched in the mouth. And uh, this guy, he, was, he wasn't playing games. He was straight to the point. Um, he was no nonsense. And he said, Sean, life's not about you. It's not about your agenda. In fact, let me tell you what life is about. Life is about God, and it is about God's agenda, and God has a very basic and simple agenda. And it's this, it's to make himself known worldwide, among every tongue, every tribe, all nations, languages, and ethnic groups. And he's doing that in a very unique and specific way. He's doing it through the finished work of his son, Jesus Christ. 
And then he took this book, the Bible, you guys, and he opened it up and he walked me from Genesis chapter one all the way through the book of Revelation. He actually went through the maps in the back, too. Did you know there are maps in the back of your Bible? And he walked me through all of God's word from cover to cover, unfolding for me what God's purpose was to make himself known through his son among every tongue, tribe, people, nation and ethnic group on the planet. And by the time this guy got done talking, um, I have tried to describe over the years a half a dozen different ways what happened to me. And the simplest way to say it was this, that the Holy Spirit did what the Holy Spirit does, which takes the word of God, living and active, sharper than a double edged sword, and used it to pierce into my heart and to convict me right, of my selfish motives and to expose to me my selfish intent in pursuing and chasing this thing that we call the American dream. And up to that point, quite frankly, you guys, I had never heard God's word talked about that way. I'd never heard God's world talked about that way. I'd never heard this thing that we talk about called global missions spoken of in that way up to that point in my Christian life. Um, I thought that this thing that we talk, call Christian missions was the thing that happens over in Matthew 28, um, you know, or that thing that happens post-Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, 3, sort of a deal. And here I was for the first time sort of laid bare. Um, laid open to the reality that God's purpose to make himself known among all the nations is not a New Testament thing, it's a whole Bible thing. And I realized quite quickly, not on my own accord, but through the grace of the Lord Jesus, that if this is true, right, if God has this purpose to make himself known among every tongue, tribe, and nation, and this is what the whole Bible is about, is God revealing himself through his Son to all tongues, tribes, and nations, I began to realize this is going to have really significant implications for my life. I began to realize that this would mean more than me just giving a little money to cross-cultural work. I began to think this is going to mean way more than me just sort of going on some short-term mission trip, right? For a week or a few days, I began to think to myself, wow, if God's purpose is to make himself known among every tongue, tribe, and nation, then this is going to have an impact on my marriage, my parenting, how I spend my time, right? What I do in my small group, how I interact with my Sunday school class, how I read the news. Like if this is true, that the whole of Scripture is about God making himself known to every tongue, tribe, and nation through Jesus, then this is massive. This, is, this has implications that are extremely far-reaching. And so I promise you that close to 20 years ago, when this gentleman opened up God's word and walked me through the Bible, I never would have imagined finding myself in northern Minnesota preaching and teaching with you guys today. But here we are. And so the reason that Mark called me and the reason the Lord has brought me here is because I intend this morning in the next 32 minutes to walk you through the entire Bible. So I don't know what time you thought you were going to get out of here. Um, I was told by the pastor that I have a tight 40 minutes. They even gave me extra time. And so my hope this morning is to show you from God's word that this thing that we call global missions, okay, it's not my idea. It's not Mark's idea. It's not a once a year thing that we do at a missions conference, right? That missions is whose idea, Chisholm? It's God's. And if missions matters to God, then a question that we need to be asking ourselves this morning, this weekend, tomorrow, next week, next month, five years from now, is if global missions matters to God, then a very simple question we have to ask ourselves is this, does it matter to me? Now, I don't intend to know what that will mean for every one of you, but regardless of what age or stage, what vocation or what location our life has us in, if we wave the banner of Jesus Christ over our lives, then every single one of us who are united to the head, we as the body, have a part to play in what God's doing globally. And so I hope that you will see from God's word this morning what his clear intentions are to make himself known and to ask the spirit to work in your life as to what he would have you to do next. So I'm going to pray for us and then we're going to open up God's word and I'm going to walk us from Genesis to Revelation quite quickly. Does that sound okay? All right, let me pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be with these friends, these other Christian brothers and sisters. God, thanks for gathering us all here this morning in light of the weather that you 
are in control of. Man plans his ways and the Lord directs his steps. And so you intend to speak this morning. And so help us by the power of your spirit to hear. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So the story of God's global purpose gets started where any good story gets started in the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1. And um, in Genesis chapter 1, there are two people on the planet, Adam and who? Eve, that's exactly right. John, I'm not sure why. The clicker has decided not to work. I told you, Joel. I told you. <clears throat> so if you just want to hit the advance arrow down there on the bottom, we'll move to that first slide. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> so in Genesis chapter 1, there are two people on the planet, Adam and who? And God comes to them in Genesis 1.28, and you'll notice, friends, that he gives them the very first commandment in Scripture, and this is what we're told that it says. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, and do what? Fill the earth. Okay, God comes to Adam and Eve, he commands them to fill the earth. This is the very first commandment that God gives mankind in Scripture. If you think about it long enough and hard enough, it's also about the only one that we've managed to keep. Okay. You can have that, that conversation over the fellowship lunch this afternoon, okay? So God comes to Adam and Eve. He commands them to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Literally, what God is commanding Adam and Eve to do is to grow their family, to grow it big. Children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. And Adam and Eve, I want you to fill the earth, populate the earth physically with your descendants. And here's why. Because at this point in the story, friends, there's no sin between God and mankind. They are living in a perfect relationship with one another. And so in essence, what God is saying is simply this. Adam and Eve, as you begin to fill the earth physically with your descendants, I want you to teach them and train them what it means to know me, to worship me, follow me, obey me, love me, and adore me. And so what you'll be doing as you fill the earth physically, teaching your descendants what it means to know me spiritually, you'll be populating the earth spiritually with a planet full of people who know me and worship me. That's what God is after that's what he wants, is a planet full of people who know him and worship him. The refrain of scripture is that God says, I will be their God and they will be my what? My people, right? However, we know by the time we get to Genesis chapter 3 that man sins, they sever their relationship with God. And by the time we get to Genesis chapter 6 verse 5, the Bible says that every intention in mankind's heart was only set on evil all the time. Six chapters into the Bible, utter wickedness fills the earth. And by the time you get to Genesis chapter 7, God floods the earth. He responds in righteous judgment. And essentially, he hits the reset button and he starts over with a second family. And in Genesis 9, 1, notice God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, and what? Chisholm? Fill the earth. Notice we're not even 10 chapters into the entire Bible and twice already God has commanded mankind to fill the earth right? Fill the earth. God says, go, fill the earth. The command is crystal clear. But what is the difference between Genesis 9 and Genesis 1? Sin. That is exactly right. Sin has now entered the narrative and the story of humanity such that mankind is at rebellion with God. They are at war with him, right? There are no neutral parties in the world today. You either love God and you hate sin, or you love sin and you what? Hate God. That's the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. And so, nine chapters into the Bible, mankind is at war with God. In fact, two chapters later, by the time you come to this story called the Tower of Babel, here's what we're told, friends, that's going on. Now, the whole earth had one language and a common speech. So no matter where you went on planet earth, everybody was speaking how many languages, Chisholm? One, right? English, of course. And as men moved eastward, we don't know what it was, by the way, just in case you're wondering. As men moved eastward, we are told that they found a plain in a place called Shinar. And the Bible says that they settled there. And they said, let us make a name for ourselves. Let us build a tower that reaches to the heavens. A tower that reaches to the sky so that we might make a name for ourselves and not 
be scattered over the face of the whole earth. God had commanded mankind to do what? To fill the earth. God said, go, and mankind said what? No. Now, you don't have to have great Bible interpretation skills to figure out that this is what we call direct disobedience. The defiance of man on display, God commanded them to fill the earth, to make his name great. Mankind says, no, we'll stay put and we'll make our name great. Rather than leave, we'll stay. Rather than glorify you, we'll glorify ourselves. Now, if you're following along in the narrative, you are thinking to yourself, what might God's response be at this point? Right? If you've been following closely, just a few chapters before, he flooded the earth, wiped out everyone and everything with the exception of Noah and his family and the animals two by two. And you get to this point, God says, go, mankind says, no. And you're thinking, man, is he just going to send them into the sun? Right? It's not what happens. In fact, God responds, and this is what we're told. The Lord said, come, let us go down and can." Fused their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them there over the face of the whole earth and they stopped building the tower. Now before, how many languages were they speaking? One. And now we go from one language to many languages. We go from one location to many locations. In fact, right here in Genesis chapter 11, this is where all of the known languages in the world today originally came from. Right here in Genesis chapter 11. Now, if you remember, the thing that seems quite paradoxical, if you're following, again, closely along in the biblical narrative here, is that what God intended from Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, was to have a people gathered to himself who knew him, praised him, and worshipped him. That's what God wanted, was a people for himself gathered to him. But what has he done here in Genesis chapter 11? He has what? Scattered them. And so you get to Genesis chapter 11 and all of this tension is building. It's bringing us to a place where the question is begging. What is God going to do to then gather a people to himself who he has scattered? And we don't have to go very far to find an answer. Because just a chapter later, God is going to kickstart the gathering process with one man. And if you have your Bibles open to where I asked you to, Genesis chapter 12, we are told that God is going to kickstart the gathering process with who, friends? Abraham. And in Genesis chapter 12, we are told this, that the Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and I want you to go to the land that I will show you. God is going to pick one man. The Bible tells us that his name is Abram. The Bible also tells us that he is 75 years old when God interrupts his life and his agenda. Okay, in America today, we have a word for 75 years old. It's called what? Retired, old, okay. There's a few words that we could use. Here's the point. I know that they lived much longer in those days than we do today. But the point is simply this, Abraham is 75. And if you've been around Christianity for any amount of time, sometimes these biblical stories, if we're not careful, friends, can become like white noise. We forget that Abraham was a real man. I say this with the utmost respect that some of you in this room are older. Imagine the Lord coming and saying to you, leave. Leave Chisholm. I grew up in a town of 2,100 people. My grandfather was a lead miner. My dad, who is to turn 68 on April the 12th this year, has spent his entire life living in the exact same town that he grew up in. He's a homebody if there ever was one. That might be the case for some of you here this morning. But imagine the Lord coming to you and saying, pack up. Pack up your stuff and get out of town. 
And what does he ask him to leave? Abraham, I'm commanding you to leave your land. Abraham lived in the land of Ur at that time. It was a port city in the Persian Gulf. It was rich in commerce and trade, materialism. It was soaked in idolatry. Abram was an idol worshiper. Joshua chapter 24 tells us that. Abram was not looking for God. God came and spoke to Abraham in his sovereign grace. And he commands him to leave. It's not a good idea. Notice it's not if it's convenient. Notice it's not if Abraham likes the idea. God speaks, and Abraham has a choice. To what? Obey or disobey? Because revelation always demands a response from us. Always. Revelation always demands a response. And God commands him to leave his country, and not only to leave his country, but to leave his family, his people. The people who he'd grown up with, done life with, who he shared the closest relationships with. And God commands him to leave his land, leave his loved ones, and to leave his father's household. If you're Abraham, right, you don't have the option to consider what career choices you'd be interested in, where you'd like to live, what your, right, what your hopes, dreams, goals, and ambitions are. If you're Abraham, you're going to do what when you grow up? You're going to do what your daddy does. And if you're Abraham, where are you going to live? Where your daddy what? Lives. And if your people sojourns, you sojourn with them. So what exactly is God commanding Abraham to leave here? Just so we're clear. Everything. If Abraham outlives his father, then he'll get his inheritance. So when God says, Abraham, I'm commanding you to leave your land, I'm commanding you to leave your loved ones, and I'm commanding you to leave your father's household. God's essentially saying, Abraham, I want you to walk away from everything you know, all your comfort, safety, and security. In fact, I want you to take a match, light it on fire, and throw it onto your 401k. And I want you to watch it burn to the ground. Because I'm actually going to give you land. I'm actually going to give you descendants. And Abraham, I'm commanding you to leave your father because I'm going to be your father. In fact, he goes on and watch what he says. I'm going to make you into a great nation and bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And Abraham, through you, all peoples on earth will be blessed. Abraham doesn't know where he's going. He doesn't know how long he's even going to be there. God says when when he commands him to leave his land, his loved ones, and his father, he says, go to a place I will show you. He doesn't tell him where he's going, how long he's staying. So, Long before this is ever a a, a missionary call for Abraham, it's a call not to a place, but to a what? A person. And God's saying, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. In fact, even though I'm commanding there to be a break away from these things, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to make your name great, but those blessings aren't for you, Abraham. The blessings that I'm giving you, I'm blessing you so that, Abraham, you'll be a what? A blessing. The blessings are coming to you, Abraham, because I intend to move them through you. And the blessings that God is ultimately talking about are not material blessings. We know from chapter 13 that Abraham was arguably one of the wealthiest men in the ancient Near East. Him and Lot are having to try to figure out where they're going to spread out with all their stuff. But that's not the ultimate blessing that God is talking about in Genesis chapter 12. And by the way, if you're looking at your clock and you're thinking we're only at Genesis 12, we are never going to get through this thing. Don't worry. Fear not, little flock. Okay? We're going to spend a decent amount of time on Genesis 12, and here's why. If you miss Genesis 12, friends, if you miss Genesis 12, I would make the argument that you're going to miss your whole Bible. Martin Luther, the great reformer, okay, quite a polarizing man, said that Genesis 12, 1 through 3 were some of the most important passages in the entire Scripture. If you miss this, you'll miss your Bible. If you miss this, you're going to miss the missions conference. That's why we're parking it here, and I'm pumping the brakes for just a few minutes. We'll make quick work of the rest of the Scripture, don't worry. But here's what I want you to see. Abraham, you're being blessed in order to be a what? A blessing. And who's the blessing for? What's it say? All what? 
All peoples, tribes, tongues, nations, languages, families, depending on what translation of Scripture you read. Maybe the King James, the NASB, right? The CSB, the ESV. I call that one the extra spiritual version, okay? <clears throat> so, whatever you're reading, here's the point. Abraham is being blessed in order to say it with me. Be a blessing, right? And what's the ultimate blessing that Abraham's going to be blessed with? It's actually through Abraham, that the promised Messiah is going to come. We're told in Galatians 3.8, over in the New Testament, that God is actually preaching the gospel right here to Abraham. That God preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you all nations will be blessed. Not probably, maybe, hopefully, but what? Will. It's a done deal. And so the ultimate blessing that every tongue, tribe, and nation will one day be blessed with is the good news of the gospel that Jesus Christ came to fix what mankind messed up back in Genesis chapter 3 when we sinned. And He's going to step onto the scene, fully God and fully man, living the perfect, sinless life that none of us in this room have ever got a shot at living. In thought, word, and deed. And then He's going to march to the cross and He's going to be crucified on behalf of sinners as a substitute in their place for their sins. He's going to be buried and three days later, God the Father, through the power of the Spirit, is going to raise Him from the dead, proving to the world that He's exactly who He said He was. And God goes on to say that whoever will turn from their sins and put their faith and trust in Him, God says, I'll wipe your slate clean and give you life forever with Me. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, I would ask you, to turn from your sins and put your faith and trust in Christ. And that gift, the gift of forgiveness, right? What is the greatest blessing that mankind can give us? It's not things, it's not family, it's not stuff, it's not a career. Psalm 32, blessed is the man whose sins are what? Forgiven. And that blessing is eventually going to make its way to every tongue, tribe, and nation. In fact, what you're going to see from this point forward, friends, is that God's going to reveal His purpose through His promise. You used to hearing me say it. I'll say it about three dozen more times before we get done. God's going to reveal and fulfill His purpose through His promise. And what's His promise? To bless all nations, Jews and what? Gentiles. In fact, He repeats the promise to Isaac, Abraham's son, that through him all nations would be blessed. He repeats the promise to Jacob, Isaac's son, Abraham's grandson. Isaac, Jacob, through you, all peoples, all nations will be blessed. And so we go from the promise being made to one man, to one family, and eventually God's going to grow Abraham's family into the nation of Israel. And one simple way to summarize the entire Old Testament would be this, that out of all the nations, God chose one nation to reach all nations. Who was that one nation? Israel. Israel, you're my chosen people. It is for my chosen purpose. And what is my purpose? It is to fulfill a promise. And where is my promise? In Genesis 12. And what does it include to bless all people? So let me say that again because that's a lot of peace. Okay, Israel, you're my chosen people for my chosen purpose. My purpose is to fulfill a promise, and my promise is to bless who? All peoples. Jews, Gentiles, Americans, Laotians, Venezuelans, Vietnamese, and right on down the list. Majority languages, minority languages. And so what you're going to see as we fly through the Old Testament and into the New is that in example after example after example, ones that I suspect many of us in this room are familiar with, God is at work to fulfill His purpose and His promise. How about the first example that we'll take a look at is the ten plagues. Why did God bring the ten plagues on the Egyptians? Why did He deliver Israel in the way that He did? We're told in Exodus 9.16 that it was for this purpose that God raised up Pharaoh. It was to display His power so that His name might be proclaimed Where? In all the earth. When God did what He did to redeem the Israelites out from under the hand of the Egyptians, it was not only for the Israelites, but it was so that the Egyptians might know who God was. A half a dozen times we are told that God was doing what He was doing so that the Egyptians would know. And not only the Egyptians, but what's the text tell us? The whole what? The whole earth. Egypt was the most powerful nation probably in the known world at that time. And in a matter of ten plagues, Egypt has been raised to the ground. 
such that the whole world has seen the power of God. And so even in the ten plagues, friends, God is at work to fulfill His purpose through His promise. And not only in the ten plagues, but we know that eventually the Israelites leave Egypt. Moses goes to the mountain to get the law. And we see not only that God is at work to fulfill His purpose and fulfilling His promise in the ten plagues, but even in the giving of the ten commandments. Moses tells the Israelites to observe them carefully, for this will show their wisdom and their understanding to who? Say it with me, Chisholm. The what? The nations. Right? Even when God gave the Ten Commandments, Israel's obedience to God, friends, was a reflection of God. Because the world was watching the Israelites. They were to be like a city set on a hill. Deuteronomy 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, those last chapters of Deuteronomy, Moses says that God is blessing you, Israel, and don't presume upon these blessings that your hand, your might, your strength got you what you have. God's giving you what you have so that you might be a light to the nations. And so, not only in the ten plagues, but in the giving of the law and the ten commandments, we see God at work to fulfill His purpose through His promise. Further, we know that eventually, right, they take possession of the land. The kingdom is established. One of the first kings out of the gates is King Saul. He has a miserable start and a lousy finish. And one of the young men who are on his coattails is King David. And David faces this giant in this infamous battle. How many of you have heard the story? Okay, only half of us. (laughs) I come to the right place. Who's heard the story of David and Goliath? Yeah, almost all of us. Why did God allow David to slaughter Goliath? Well, look, friends, the text tells us. David says this day, Goliath, I will strike you down. I will remove your head. I'm going to give the dead bodies of the Philistines to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the earth. Why? So that all the earth might know there's a God in Israel. And so not only in the ten plagues, the ten commandments and Right, stories like David and Goliath, in all of these, God is at work to fulfill a promise that he made in Genesis 12. God is at work to reveal himself to Israelites. He's at work to reveal himself to Egyptians. He's at work to reveal himself to Philistines, Canaanites, Moabites. Not only does he aim to fulfill his purpose through his promise in the battle of David and Goliath, but eventually we know that Solomon takes the throne and he asks that God would give him wisdom so that he might lead the people of Israel and God gives him not only the wisdom but the wealth. But why all the blessings? Well, we're told in 1 Kings 4.34 that people of all nations came to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all the kings of the earth. The Queen of Sheba is going to travel over 1,500 miles north, probably from... Somewhere in modern day Yemen, Ethiopia, we're not entirely sure. All the way up to see King Solomon and to listen to him speak. And by the time this pagan Gentile queen from the nations leaves the presence of King Solomon, what is she saying? Blessed be the God of Israel. In fact, Jesus is going to take that very story and use it to indict his own countrymen because of their hard-hearted unbelief. And so what's my point but to simply demonstrate to you in quick order that God is working in and through Israel over the course of the entire Old Testament to reveal Himself to the nations because He had promised to Abraham and his family that He would do so. If time would allow me, I would walk through example after example after example after example with you of God at work to do this in the Old Testament. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel in the lion's den, Naaman the Syrian, Rahab the Canaanite, Ruth the Moabite, the whole book of Jonah where God tells Jonah to go preach to a rebellious, God-hating group of people, the Ninevites. And so whether it's Syrians, Philistines, Egyptians, Moabites, Canaanites, Israelites, God had promised to Abraham that in and through him he would make himself known to the nations. And not only do we see it in many Old Testament examples, it's all over in the Psalms. Psalm 46.10 says, be still and what? You know the rest of it? Know that I am God. This is what it says and this is what it often looks like. 
Some of you may have a picture like this in the foyer of your house. And if it's not in the foyer, it's probably in the bathroom. <laughs> and I know because I've stayed in your houses all across this country. See that little A right there? Psalm 4610A. Why do they put those letters on there? It's because it's telling us that there's more to be said, but there's just not enough white space on the paper. And there's a whole second half to this verse, friends. And here's what we're told that it says. Some of you guys are like, we're going to have to go home and get out the Sharpie. In Genesis 12, God promised to Abraham that in and through him, he would work to reveal himself and to bless the nations. And we see it in the Ten Plagues, the Ten Commandments, the Red Sea, the River Jordan, David and Goliath, Solomon and his wisdom, Daniel in the lion's den, Ruth the Moabite, Rahab the Canaanite, Naaman the Syrian, the whole Ninevites in the book of Jonah. We see it in the Psalms, we see it in the major prophets, we see it in the minor prophets. In fact, as you turn from the Old Testament to the New, nothing changes. Jesus steps onto the scene, he lives a perfect sinless life, begins his ministry at the age of 30, and after three years of revealing himself to be the very Son of God, he is crucified for the sins of his people, resurrects from the dead, and post-resurrection, he gives what we call the Great Commission Passages. And on five different occasions, he makes plain to his disciples, and not only the disciples, but the local church. Right? It is the local church by which God intends to make himself known to the nations. Right? When, when Jesus gives the Great Commission passage, you might consider these verses to be nothing more than Genesis 12, 2.0. Jesus is simply repeating what God had promised to Abraham. Make disciples of all nations. Go into all the world. Forgiveness of sins will be preached in His name to all nations. As the Father has sent me, so am I sending you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and where, friends? The ends of the earth. And what God promised Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, He will bring to completion because in Revelation 7-9, John gets a vision of what the throne room will look like. And this is what he tells us, that there will be people so many of them that he cannot count from every tongue, every tribe, all nations, and all what? Languages. And what are they doing? They're standing around the throne, and they're worshiping the Lamb. What did God want in Genesis chapter 1? A planet full of people who knew him and who what? Worshipped him. And what will God get in the new heavens and the new earth. He will get a planet full of people from all peoples. Let me say that again. In the new heavens and the new earth, God will get a planet full of people from all peoples. Because Revelation 7-9 is as sure as the sunrise tomorrow. This is what all of human history is moving towards. As nations rise and fall, as governing authorities come and go, God intends to see His promise through to gather a people to Himself from every tongue, tribe, and nation. And He's doing it through the church. He's doing it through local churches, just like you, friends. He's doing it through churches in Minnesota. He's doing it through churches in Arkansas. And he doesn't need any of us. And yet the mystery is he's inviting us in to be a part of participating in it with him. He's asking us if we'll put our yes on the table and be prepared to be used by Him in any shape, form, or fashion. And so here's what I would have us to see this morning. 
promise made? Promise what? Kept. Missions matters to God. And so a great question for us to ask again this morning, this afternoon, tomorrow, and in the years to come is, does it matter to who? Does it matter to us? And in light of that, holding an open hand to ask the Lord, how might he want to use us and what he's doing globally? So I hope you stick around this afternoon. We're going to spend more time unpacking this and talking about how this has bearing on our life. And with that, let me pray, and we'll end the service. Father, thank you for our time this morning together in your word. And thank you for a chance to see what you're doing. We do ask that you would help us to consider what this means for our life. Here, today, tomorrow, Lord, and in the days to come. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.